<coughs> right. Good evening. Good evening. This is um, the first session in uh, a new course for the Free University of Brighton that I'm running uh, called The Earth as a Freudian Spaceship. Welcome if you're here. Uh, this is going to be a kind of 10 week course. Um, it's in a couple of parts. Uh, so there's an introduction session today, and then there is four weeks um, that makes up the rest of the first half, and then there'll be a second half. Uh, I've got a course outline on River and on the Discord. If you want to have a look at that, it's got some of the reading that's going to be taking place. And the other thing to say is that the course is exploratory. Um, so this is more of a seminar than a course in some ways. This is a kind of following a line of thought. Um, and as I've explained in uh, River and on Discord and in some of the earlier sort of materials um, introducing this course, um, this is a course that's a result of a, a research project for about four or five years that I've been working on with someone called Eric Harper. And this is part of the process of... Um, writing up. So we're doing a lot of writing down, we've been writing out notes, we've been thinking, talking, chatting, um, reading, watching, all that kind of stuff, um, making uh, making texts as part of that um, and we're sort of uh, at that stage of more writing down than writing up now so this is part of that process of moving into that. So this is kind of a kind of a report on a research project in some ways. Uh, oh, and good luck, Machinators. Have a, no a first gig. Good luck with a gig, man. Have a nice one. Um, so, yeah, this is a kind of report on a research project. And so it's it's going to be kind of following a line of thought. And you're welcome to join in with me and, and follow that line a, a little way. See how it takes you. Um, and then perhaps uh, hopefully spur you to think your own thoughts as well. Uh, in terms of content, most of this is going to be... Um, as I say, you know, the result of the research project and therefore kind of um, independent thought in that sense, you know, so it's kind of on it, it's best taking it on its own terms. In other words, it's not a reading of another philosopher, it's not an interpretation of another philosopher. I'm not trying to analyze or give an account of uh, another philosopher or really analyze or give an account of another kind of concept that already exists inside the philosophical domain, although we will be using other philosophers and using concepts that already exist in the philosophical domain. This is more of a kind of, uh, as I say, a line of thought, an attempt to try and establish something like a working model of thinking about the world, um, and one obviously that we don't expect to be finished or final. Um, um, the idea is to try and put this model to work a little bit, to see how it goes, to see obviously what its limitations are, all those kind of things. So bear that in mind when you're sort of going through the course. Obviously, this does mean um, that uh, the seminar conversations are particularly useful here. Um, this is not a kind of simple course where you can, uh, you know, have a book and we can all follow it through and I can talk you through stuff and then we can kind of, you know, look at the book and then go to the next stage. It, it's not going to quite work like that. So the seminar conversation is going to be useful if you can participate. But there's many ways to participate, either contemporaneously as we're going along now. This is uh, the 24th of July 2021. So you can either participate contemporaneously as we're going, out, going along now, either you know, in your own way on River, if you're in the Free University of Brighton, or in your own way on Discord, if you want to. And um, if you're coming across this material at another stage, then you can participate in your own way by getting in contact, having a conversation, etc., etc. So I'm just going to go through. We're going to be in two parts tonight. First of all, trying to sort of outline a little bit of, uh, let's say, the problem um, that we're beginning to or trying to address in, in this project, and then a little bit. In the second part, a reflection on one of the texts I've given out and that's available, which is um, part one of the book that we're working on, part one called Breath, and it's part one of a three-part text. Um, and so the second part tonight is going to kind of ref offer some reflections on that. Um, and that just speaks to a bit of the methodology. So part of the methodology of this course is there will be uh, a written text uh, from the project called uh, part one, Breath, um, that, you, that we'll be reading week by week as we go through and then we'll also be reading various other texts that are kind of part of the background material for those for that project um, background text from Fanon, from Freud, from Deleuze and Guattari, possibly from Marx as well um, and alongside the background text we'll be looking at uh, sort of fragments and 
um, sections from uh, sort of the unpublished, the the un unprinted out part of the project. So you'd have the printed out part of the project, some of the background uh, material that we think and work with, and then some of the lecture will sort of focus on bits of the text from the un unpublished part of the project, if you like. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> These are still strange times and this course will obviously take place as we come out of COVID. So there's a kind of strangeness in still doing it in this kind of strange COVID space of my computer and box and video and all these kind of things. That's still a little odd. OK, so let's. Um, let's crack on. So just relax and sort of, you know, um, see if you can follow. And, and as I say, in the seminar, we can we can uh, begin to try and sort of work out some questions about some of the stuff that I'm bringing up today. So uh, one of this today's session is titled um, Thinking the World, uh, Thinking the World as a Freudian Spaceship in particular. Um, and so when, we're, when we say something like thinking the world as a Freudian spaceship, I mean, what are we talking about when we speak of a Freudian spaceship? And we, by we, I mean here, me and Eric, or in the project that I'm coming from. Uh, so what are we talking about when we speak of a Freudian spaceship? We imagine the Earth as a Freudian spaceship. Um, it was kind of a, a, one of the first moves of the project was to try and create this image. In other words, um, as the home of life, moving through space, uh, and which is not just alive in its own right, uh, we obviously th often think about the Earth as being alive, but which is alive in a, in a, in a quite Freudian sense. In other words, uh, it's alive in the sense in which it is driven, it's comprised of drives, and it's also comprised of an unconscious formed by something like a moment of primary repression. Um, now that's immediately to kind of take this image and use of Freudian psychoanalysis, the drives and the unconscious, and completely metaphorize them in some way, completely expand them beyond where they're meant to to uh, apply, um, and you know create this kind of poetic figment, this the Earth as a Freudian spaceship that could somehow sort of you know be subject to psychoanalysis. Um, now it's a working tool. This it, it is an image, a working tool, and it's one that we hope enables us to try and think beyond their own perspective as, as human or, or as animal, and in doing so try to become something other, um, try and, and, and imagine the limits and possible futures. Now this use of, a, of an image or idea like this is also a key part of our methodology, not no doubt just ours. Um, we develop, for example, through the project three figures. Uh, sometimes these can be called conceptual personae. This is a phrase that comes from Deleuze and Guattari in their book, What is Philosophy? Um, and th these three figures, these conceptual personae, these are like characters in a novel, if you like. That's, you know, that's one of the things they're a bit like. Uh, and they're there to give us um, you know, a way of trying to think concretely about certain problems. Um, and we develop three figures um, that we think offer modes of living that we affirm or that we think we can learn from. These three figures uh, are the revolutionary, the sorcerer, and the psychoanalyst. Another feature of our methodology is that we, we try and allow our intuitions and a kind of poetics into our thought as a way of allowing our bodies to speak as well as our minds. Uh, we pay attention, for example, to signs or symptoms um, in the world, things we notice, respond to. And we try to assemble them together into something like a body as a way of thinking that doesn't dismiss rationality and yet doesn't deny the irrational. Now that's a, that's a, a fairly standard sort of dichotomy and this is just a kind of a methodology for us not getting trapped in that kind of uh, dichotomy between rational and, and irrational. And above all what we try and do is we try and find a way to respond to the world around us with honesty. Uh, knowing all the while that this is never a simple matter, um, it's always bound up with our own kind of social, our, f our psychical, our physical needs, it's bound up with who we are and, and where we are and how we respond. And it's also bound up with problems that I'll begin to think about as we go through the course of, of what it is to respond um, and how that response can, in a sense, not just be uh, a passive, how it can not just be automatic or kind of reflex. So the Freudian spaceship is a name that we kind of give, therefore, to we can call the complex assemblage of the, the Earth, the world and the planet. This is another kind of way in which we often try and think. Um, 
these things the earth the world the planet they kind of name the same space but they name it in different kinds of ways they t they're, they're organizing it in different kinds of ways for us um so the freudian spaceship is the name we give to this complex assemblage of of this home or this space that we live in um that's sometimes called the earth sometimes the world sometimes the planet and obviously we might also call this our home uh and this idea of home homelessness being at home um, these are kind of very important backgrounds for some of what we're thinking now at the very least the earth we might say is a home of life and it is life that we pay attention to in thinking the world um, so we're a kind of we're, we're developing we're not a vitalism but we are paying attention to or interested in this this concept of or this thing that is referred to as life which as uh, Foucault indicates, uh, you know, in, in some places, is, is a relatively new concept. It's a concept that arises um, out of some of the developments in biological sciences in the 18th, 19th century. Um, but we pay attention to that life when we're thinking the world. For example, the litany, that kind of list of words, Earth, world, planet, is greater than we think just the name world. Not just because it's plural, but because in each case, as I mentioned, these names... Uh, name something different more importantly they're different forms and they perhaps even have different laws in each area or at least perhaps different laws that matter or that make a difference in each area so what ma what matters when we talk about the earth might be different from what matters when we talk about a world or the world and again when we talk about the planet and part of this kind of multiple naming the these kind of uses of images um, this attention to symptoms signs this attempt to assemble them all together in some kind of way part of this is a struggle against bad abstractions um, <coughs> and that might seem you know in some ways uh, in some ways a strange thing to say because plainly it looks like we're beginning to use abstractions we're beginning to try and and, and use these kind of um, like names words in a way that seems vague or abstract in, in and obviously um, there's an inevitability to that when we first introduce them in some sense all i can do in this particular session is is introduce some of these terms but in general the dynamic of trying to use these terms is to struggle as i say against what we would call bad abstractions um, and in particular one of the things i want to think about in, t what in, in terms of what a bad abstraction might be is, is i want to think about what we might call the problem of scale um, or sometimes this we encounter this problem around issues of, of what are sometimes called totalizations or universalities and so generally speaking we might say we want to struggle against a bad abstraction by going to the concrete that might be one way in which you know a struggle against bad abstractions might take place um, let's make things concrete and uh, that's in a sense exactly how we we kind of began this project from something very concrete and in particular from the concrete problem of how do we respond to this very concrete thing our thinking is prompted in the first instance um, by the problem that presents itself in the conjunction of two ongoing situations climate change um, or the climate crisis depending upon what you want to call it uh, and the black lives matter struggle um, but at the heart of these these concrete situations that we encountered over the last five years and some of which have been there longer particularly with climate change um, in a sense in, uh, b uh, black lives matter is a, is a new instantiation of again something that's been there much longer um, but our response to these like contemporary moments um, in other words the way in which we kind of have them in our world at this time uh, either through the news media or through social media or through education kind of had in our way in a way in our world in a particular way uh, whilst they prompt our thinking um the problem is for us uh, is for us how to respond in such a way that our responses aren't captured um and are free responses um, in other words how not to uh, not to <laughs> how not to have a knee-jerk re reaction in some ways how, how to enable thought in the space of this situation what is it to be able to respond um, because obviously to respond with caution and with a kind of well let's think about it let's all be careful that also is a, is a particular kind of response that is 
problematic and is just as captured in a sense because it's trying to avoid violence it's trying to avoid anger it's trying to avoid passion you know it wants everything to settle down and be calm and be ca you know that's just as much a kind of capture of a response in, in many ways um, than the response of anger or passion um, and that capturing of responses um, that kind of way in which we can be almost programmed to behave um, programmed to respond uh, affects everyone uh, when they encounter these kind of situations we believe so our primary resources for our project and the way we try and respond when, when we encounter these concrete situations with uh, the strategy of avoiding bad abstractions the primary resources are again going to sound in some sense abstract but the idea is that you know it's not abstraction itself that's necessarily the problem it's bad abstractions so our primary resources are as I say, in some sense, abstract themselves. So they're schizoanalysis, in particular, kind of Freud and Marx, um, and the way in which they kind of are kind of meshed together and, and operable inside Antiedipus, for example, um, but also inside the work of Freud and Marx themselves. Uh, so that's our first kind of primary resource. We came out of that kind of framework into this problem. Um, the next resource is Franz Fanon. Um, and in particular the concept of sociogenesis um, that is drawn out of Fanum in some ways by Sylvia Winter but, but is, is, is kind of a key kind of way of interesting way of, of getting uh, a, a lesson from Fanon and obviously also with regard to Fanon is the relationship to colonialism and again that kind of Fanon in a sense added to some of the, to the material and resources in, in from schizoanalysis Fanon, Fanon added this kind of a crucial relationship to what it would be to be at home on the planet, at home with life. Um, so those are our two kind of primary resources and at one point we actually described this as trying to produce something like a Fanonian schizoanalysis. So a kind of meshing, interesting use of learning from um, both of these kind of traditions, both of these resources. But our third resource is also our own biography. Um, because one of the things we were keen on when we were thinking about how to respond uh, to uh, Eric Garner's death, for example, one of the triggers for the Black Lives Matter, one of the things that was crucial for us in terms of how we respond is that we don't respond, you know, in a sense that that um, makes us uh, a neutral perspective, makes us somehow an empty vessel. Um, and again, this kind of speaks to uh, a bad abstraction. In order to respond with a positive or useful abstraction, I think it's necessary to kind of ground our understanding and reading of those within our particular biographies. <coughs> and our biographies speak in some sense to the, the three figures or the three characters that we, um, that we want to deploy or that we want to think with, which is, as, as, you men as I mentioned earlier, the revolutionary, the sorcerer, and the psychoanalyst. So from these resources, we try to make tools to think with. Uh, and this is sometimes you know, the problem of concepts or of tool making of thought. Um, and we're trying to make tools to think with that aren't subject, obviously, to simple, well, not obviously, but when they aren't subject to simple criteria of um, an end and efficiencies. So you know, it, they're not subject to a specific set goal. They're not subject to achieving that goal as quickly as possible. That's not the kind of criteria for whether a thought is useful or interesting. Um, for us, the, the criteria of what makes a useful thought in these situations is itself difficult to pin down, but it would be something like that which enables us to pay more attention to life, that a concept or a, or, or a tool of thought that enables us to pay more attention to life gives us a greater capacity and so something along those kind of lines would be our criteria not you know a pre-existing goal or uh, end that should be reached and so some of these tools that we're trying to use uh, the, the idea of scales uh, this problem of scale of, of totalizations at what point do you kind of bring things together um, or what scale and the idea that there are multiple scales uh, multiple forms that are operable operating all the time with each other 
um, that could produce something that we might call assemblages, but that's a kind of word that is, is a bit of a jargon word for Deleuze and Guattari. Um, but kind of complexes or, uh, you know, small network systems, diagrams, you know, you could imagine, if you like, <coughs> um, uh, a kind of a kind of a set of elements and their interactions. Um, but when we produce that kind of thought about a set of elements in their and their interactions, we're trying to, um, you know, produce that with this uh, idea about at what scale is this particular assemblage working? At what scale is this particular system working? And to multiply those scales, so not to have ever all just one. Um, so that's why we were thinking and talking with each other about the earth, the world and the planet, not just one of those terms, trying to use those to pick out or, or re remind ourselves or to draw in different scales. We also talk sp uh, quite, quite a lot, um, particularly in, in, in more recent parts of the project, <coughs> about three different scales in which we want to think about um, relationships of agents if you like um, we wouldn't say these are necessarily human relationships because they extend beyond the human and we would not necessarily limit them to the human um, but these three areas would be the one-to-one -one, the group and the community um, and each of those has a kind of different scale and a different set of forms and a different kind of set of dynamics and so when thinking about agential relationships what it is to be an agent what it is to respond freely to the world um, this is going to um, this is going to be different in each of those different kinds of spaces, in each of those kind of different scales. Um, as I say, we think about these three figures, <coughs> the psychoanalyst, the source of the revolution, and that's also one of our tools. We also begin very early on from something that I'm calling a breath drive, a kind of reconceiving of the libido. Um, so w one of the things that we, we you know, early on began to suggest and posit, and is one of the experimental kind of... Um, theses if you like of the project is that the first drive is is the breath not necessarily a kind of sexualized libido but a breath um, that is also not located um, because of this within uh, the human again it's extensive throughout uh, both what we might call the natural world uh, the human world and to a certain extent even um, the inorganic uh, we also talk about what we call the interval and this is the production of thought or the space of the production of thought um, this is something we'll come to and we try to develop poetic formulas comply or die is one of them for example in in the first text but we try and develop poetic formulas not to express something but enable to enable them to connect things and to see how things look in the light of those kind of formulas now a lot of that's probably not um, not super obvious, but I'm putting it there because we can refer back to the sort of th these are kind of methodologies of the texts that we'll be looking at, the way we'll be looking at, and some of the texts that we've written. So, what is the problem that we're kind of working with? Uh, at different times, that problem will be described differently. As I say, in some sense, the problem is how do we pay attention to life? How do we respond to the call of life? How do we think? Um, what it is to be at uh, be at home in a, at a planetary scale as whether well, a, a world scale, an Earth scale, you know, a one-to-one -one scale, a group scale, a community. What it is to be at home in in this complex world. Um, but in some ways, we can try and go back a little bit and think. Well, actually, part of what we're we're doing is we're we're I I in a sense responding to a more classical kind of problem. Um, we're responding to this kind of classical problem uh, between what we might call um, structure and individual or um, you know system and, and person and one of the ways of thinking about this more classical problem is to think about the phrase personification of processes so that phrase personification of processes when we think about that problem questions that we would want to ask are at what scale is the problem you know a problem the event an event in what situation is a response capable of freedom and with what tools does thinking operate? So what do I mean by that? Let's take this th as, an, as an example. Uh, this, this phrase came to mind as a way of kind of posing this when I was watching uh, a YouTube video, um, or a lecture from Michael Heinrich discussing Karl Marx's monetary theory of value. There's going to be a bit of Marx in the course. But he's, he's like there all the way through. 
And Heinrich's discussing Marx, um, and he describes a logic of capitalism where abstract process, processes dominate individuals. Um, which is an all uncommon way of describing Marxism. You know, the abstract logic of capitalism kind of dominates the individual capitalist, dominates the individual worker, decides or makes kind of a limit as to what it is they're able to do. And the way in which Heinrich described the kind of relationship between this logic of capital, this logic of capitalism with abstract processes and the individuals who are kind of affected by, these, by this system, he describes this in terms of the personification of processes and he's interrupted in his lecture <coughs> and a question is asked and the question is, is is about the choice of Marx to do science in this particular way in other words to start with categories and to imagine that persons are personifications of categories and this question is well, well you know why start this way what is it you know uh, what are the reasons for, for Marx to start this way um, and then the person who's asking the question um, asks what what in, in capital itself makes that right and Heinrich's response is an interesting one he's, he's, it, it, you know in a sense he says well there's a biographical element um, to do with the kind of situation in which Marx is working but in the end there's fundamentally a pragmatic element in terms of what in capital makes this choice of, of anal analytic practice you know what makes it right um, and Heinrich's as I say response is that in the end it's a pragmatic um, it's a pragmatic criteria as to what makes it right and the pragmatic criteria in other words means does it work and specifically when we say does it work what we're talking about when we're talking about like the use of categories the use of abstractions the use of a description of the world that involves those categories and abstractions is does the description from the logic of those categories map to the description from the activity of persons so we have two different descriptions one that, that's describing, let's say, <coughs> capital and the commodity form with its split between use value and exchange value and the necessities of the logic that kind of derives from that. Um, and on the other hand, we have capitalists and workers um, and their behaviours. <coughs> and the argument is, was does this, this description using the categories, you know, in a sense, um, map to the description from the activity of persons. Heimrich's phrase is to justify this program he says we just have to see if the analysis works and the example he gives is chapter 2 of the first volume of Capital um, which is a description of what commodity owners have to do and he says does this match to what he calls the form determination in chapter 1 of the first volume of Capital um, and this form determination this is a, a phrase in which you know Heinrich is is uh, describing Marx's account of what what capital is, what capitalism is, and and this commodity form with these two elements to it, in particular. Um, <coughs> so that description, that abstract description, chapter one, volume one, capital, and then chapter two is a description of people's activities, and the idea is to kind of map them together. That if they map together, if they work, then pragmatically speaking the analysis seems to be productive. Um, but productive of what? Um, and uh, uh, importantly, where? At what scale do these form determinations of capital appear? You know, um, it seems e when we talk about things like capital or capitalism, we're talking at kind of a historical level or a political economic level or a level of society or a level of the human. We're talking at a kind of particular scale. We don't talk about these things in terms of my minute thinking process on an everyday level, or we don't think about these things in terms of small numbers of people interacting with their, you know, uh, Freudian slips or um, or with their particular artistic practices and, and intuitions. We're talking about a, a particular kind of scale at which abstract form determinations operate and then a different kind of scale when we're talking about people's behaviors and even then that people's behaviors people's behaviors when they're with their best friends or, 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 or their partner can be quite different from people's behaviors when they're in class or in school and, and quite different again from people's behaviors when they're out in a, in a large sort of situation in terms of their city or their town in each of these things one of we think it's it's 
a good thing to think about the different scales at which things are operating. So when we think simply about this idea of abstractions, categories and a kind of logic of the world um, and its mapping to a description of the activity of persons, um, immediately we also have to bring into this, we think, this kind of relationship of, of these different scales and perhaps begin to play around with them to see whether there's um, missing uh, elements, whether there are different things that can be put in there, different things that work. And so the question constantly is, what scale do my tools of thinking come from? What scale do my tools of thinking work on? And this is not, as, as it were, a question to be answered. It's a kind of methodological checking practice. And um, philosophy, for example, often, often, often appears, often comes onto the scene, as it were, at a particular scale of thinking, one that is expansive, one that is all-consuming, one that is very often connected to something that we might call the universal, uh, or a grasping of the whole. And yet each time philosophy appears or comes onto the scene, it also appears in a very singular and specific way. It's always a grasping of the whole, if it is, from a kind of specific position. It's not like the philosopher, as it were, is somehow um, absent from the philosophy. Now this is a phrase that is um, uh, or was a lot more famous a few years ago, perhaps not so famous now, but what we're basically trying to sort of argue here is that there is no view from nowhere. This is a famous phrase from a, someone called Thomas Nagel in, in discussions of philosophy of mind in particular. Um, and this also derives, you know, it has a kind of background in in a kind of Nietzscheanism, it has a kind of background in, obviously in the schizoanalysis, it has a kind of background in a whole process of philosophical activity that attempts to um, reorganize the use of abstract categories to prevent bad abstractions and produce more concrete relationships. In other words, to produce a situation in which that description of a kind of logic of the world better maps a description of the activity of persons. Now this nowhere, or we might also say this no when, um, uh, this the, 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 you know, these kind of abstractions from space and time are the sort of things we find, for example, in um, what Spinoza called his subspecies eternitas, in other words, the view from eternity. We could find them inside philosophy as, as though they were a kind of inside Spinoza, for example, in that, in that situation, as, as though there were a kind of final complete position of adequate knowledge, what Spinoza calls adequate knowledge. Adequate knowledge is more than that which has come from your senses and your imagination. It's the point at which you've kind of accessed the logic or the necessities involved in your knowledge. And the common tropes of philosophy to, you know, to, you know, uh, to assert the need for something like this, this view from eternity, this subspecies eternitas, um, or alternatively, to deny its adequacy. Um, the former, for example, this kind of need for something like a view from uh, from eternity. This, the former is a kind of rationalism quite often, in which things like necessity and law are crucial. And the latter, the denial of the adequacy of the view from nowhere. The, the latter is often a kind of empiricism, with, with emphasis on things like contingency and accident. But rather than considering these kind of different relationships to that kind of sense of knowledge as opposed, Again, rather than think of them as opposed, we want to try and think of them as different scales at which um, we are thinking the world. So what we're trying to do, in a sense, uh, with use of this idea of different scales, let's say when we're talking about something like the personification of processes, we're trying to pay attention to different objects that are involved in these processes. Some objects can only be seen at particular scales, in the same way that microscopes and telescopes organise you know, our, our capacity to see certain kind of objects that can't be seen at other scales. Um, often this would involve things like statistical relationships, for example, revealing certain scalar objects, certain objects that only really exist in that kind of situation of being you know, statistically brought to life. Um, patterns, things like these, these kind of objects that occur at different particular scales, different, these objects are, in a sense, different assemblages, different collections of things interacting. And 
one of the things obviously that, that can be objected to this you know to the use of like different scales is that scales can multiply and be multiplied almost to infinity and so there's a kind of gamble that we play here which is that of um, the triple or threefold minimum so at a minimum when we think about trying to think about the different scales of something or a problem um, at a minimum think in three folds think in three folds literally think at three different scales w uh, why and why is that because in a sense it enables us to think at the intersections of objects rather than the oppositions or the intersections of processes rather than in the oppositions of processes we don't need to think every scale possible that is impossible um, rather we need to think the plurality of actual scales and again this is not a law it is an attempt to try and you know, an experiment, as it were, to see what happens. So, what I'm going to do, um, it's 35 past, I, I'm inclined to let people have a five minute break, I don't know, actually I'm going to sort of, let's just have a pause for a moment. Um, so, imagine this is your pause. I uh, will come back and, and we'll carry on in a minute, actually. Um, and that just to remind you, for people in FUB, um, there will be a seminar at uh, 8 o'clock. Um, and for anyone else who's interested, there's Discord details and stuff at Twitch. So, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's try and think about these different scales then. I mean, and, and this is, is going to be just a very rough example. So we have the problem, personification of a process. How do we think the personification of a process? Um, particularly when this the very kind of dynamic of the personification of processes is, as it were, one of the crucial, cru you know, critical ways in which uh, we think the world or people think the world, not necessarily we think it. Um, so think about training, for example. I'm the reason this example came up is because I'm doing the, what's called the couch to 5K at the moment. Um, I'm doing this kind of running thing that the BBC produces an app for, and it has these little voices that come from the BBC's paraphernalia, or per, you know, this kind of you know vague. I, I think I think the person who's speaking to me is called Joe Wiley. It's a kind of DJ that I partly grew up with. So there's a kind of strange familiarity to that, and, and this app um, was recommended to me by my partner, um, and, you know, so well, uh, the, what the question is, maybe, is, uh, you know, at what scale does the app appear? You know, well, what scale does it exist, or, you know, uh, what scale is it interacted with? And so let's just use as a kind of, you know, practice example, this idea of world, earth, planet, um, and see whether we can kind of, you know, orientate, organize some things along those kind of dynamics using this idea of at least three scales, at least three different kind of levels, if you were, to see which objects are involved in this process of training. Um, so at the, at the scale of the world, um, at the scale of kind of, you know, the human horizon, let's say, um, not the individual, but the human, this kind of social horizon. Uh, we might talk about uh, something like a political or social policy scale that's involved in this particular app, this Couch to 5K app. You know, social policy to do maybe with health or well-being or, you know, um, it, involve, it might involve medical support from doctors or from medical institutions. Uh, that put limits onto the particular app. They form part of its kind of structure, its form, if you like. Uh, they put limits, for example, on how quickly the training can be done, you know, um, in terms of how many weeks it's going to be needed before you can, you know, if you, because presumably you could train faster or you could train slower, but there's a kind of point at which, uh, let's say, the institutions organize a kind of sense of safety or a sense of competence or a sense of, you know, general applicability. Um, and in this, I think in, in in the case of the app, I think it's nine weeks. Um, those kind of that kind of scale at the scale, let's say, of of like the social or the political. Um, we might have information. We might have knowledge and objects about who can be reached by such a program. Um, we might might have all sorts of issues to do with, uh, you know. Um, kind of how it connects into you know, political agendas. There could be all sorts of things, but you can imagine thinking about the app at uh, a particular kind of scale uh, that is, as it were, a political social policy scale. And we can call that, let's say, the, the scale of the world. Now, at the same time, in the encounter with the app, 
and the app only in a sense exists in this encounter um, there's someone following the instructions and in doing so moving their body through the world in a particular kind of way one that can be quite strange and um, this we can call the runner you know, so in the encounter of the pers person personifying the process the training as a personification of process one of the things that's there is is the runner um, and this runner is not there as part of a statistical um, object that maybe we're dealing with at the political or social policy scale where you know we're talking about let's say at the social or policy scale the runner is you know 30 percent of people are unfit and therefore the runner is a kind of means of transitioning from unfit to fit and so there's no real individual anywhere in that first scale of the world whereas at this scale of the earth let's say there is the runner and in that situation there's all sorts of things involved in that all sorts of things that we might be described in sometimes in terms of phenomenology or um, lived experience perhaps um, and these would include things like the decision to to run itself to use the app uh, but they'd also include familiarity with an um, access to the technology involved in it um, they would also include the encounter with the body as a running body um, in some sense one of the most interesting encounters for the person involved for me at least it, the involved in in being or becoming the app or becoming that kind of mode or becoming that training was this encounter with the body as a running body and at the heart of that um, was an encounter with breath um, so perhaps we're talking there uh, about an embodied scale rather than a social scale in the first situation we call that earth and then there's another scale at which we want to include things that may or may not be relevant but we might want to think about what objects are involved here and that we might think of as the scale of like we might call the micro or macro physical with things like gravity for example the app is not going to work in quite the same way without a whole bunch of other peripheral objects on the space station and it's not going to work in the same way on earth as it is in the space station there's a kind of you know presupposed relationship to gravity connected into the assemblage of this particular app um, in order for it to work you know, in the way it does uh, on Earth, in gravity. Um, so we might think of that as perhaps the, the hard sc science scale of, of, of the app. You know, the, uh, call it the planet, let's say. Um, now these different, the idea here is, is, is that instead of the app being one thing, we're trying to reorganize the idea of the app, the object, as a kind of intersection of processes. Um, an intersection of forces, an intersection of scales, if you like, that operate and produce different elements of uh, the objects and the assemblage of which the object is, is, is as it were, a part. Um, and in order to do that, you know, we use these kind of techniques of, of as I say, the threefold, the world, the earth, the planet, um, or we we'll use the technique later on of the one-to-one, -one, the group and the community, um, just to try and multiply without excess uh, the object that we're looking at, the object that we're trying to deal with, with any kind of abstract logic that we're thinking about. Um, so in order to enable that connection, that personification relationship, that kind of relationship of the process becoming actual, in order to enable that somehow to become again a better abstraction rather than a bad abstraction, and with a view to making it a good abstraction. So when we think about the the you know a, a process being personified the questions that are kind of relevant are, are what process what processes are being personified um, now we have to be careful here because we can like you know if we want to take a classical philosophical move we can just drop straight into self-reference um, and that always produces some interesting philosophical thought but it's probably not where we want to go in this particular project because <coughs> we'll be thinking less about the world and more about our thought at that point um, and what do I mean by self-reference? Well, you know, if we're talking about the personification of a process, um, obviously we could ask wh what happens if the process is personification itself, becoming persons. Um, we have the kind of personification of the process of becoming persons. So how in that situation do the process and the person fit together and we, you know, kind of generate this kind of self-referential mirror-on-mirror kind of situation. Um, and the process and the person... Uh, you know, are as it were, you know, twisted and combined into the thought there. Um, but we're not, and, and, that, and, and there are issues that arise in these kind of situations of self reference, and the situations of self reference are very important for thinking. But generally speaking, our methodology is kind of just going to put those to the side for this particular project. Um, and at the same time, um, try and emphasize that the process, the person, and the fit 
um, are essentially in some are essentially in some senses the kind of general theme in some ways of the project. Now, when we talk about this, um, when we talk about this, it's important to try and make I think a distinction here that I that I, I that and push back against one particular way of um, understanding this methodology, um, and that is that th this is not to a, a question of of a holistic thinking. We're not here suggesting that this is a form of thinking that that could be, um, you know, evaluated as more holistic or, or a better account of the whole. Um, rather, what we're interested in, because um, I'm not even sure that's even possible to get a holistic thinking one that's kind of and, and or, or the, whether it's desirable actually. Um, but the interest for us doesn't lie in, in, in some sense of, of being you know, a better account of the whole. Rather, the interest lies in the tensions between the different scales. Um, where one, in particular, where one scale operates against another, where there's these counteracting or countervailing tendencies. So, on the one hand, it enables us to begin to think, you know, objects with more nuance, ambiguity, variety. But importantly, it enables us to begin to try and think about the tensions within uh, um, within the different in relationships between these different scales. And so, in a sense, what what uh, what this kind of comes down to is when we're looking at something like the personification of processes, rather than thinking, um, in a sense, about some kind of uh, problematic of domination in the abstraction of being freed in the abstraction or understanding what we're trying to think about in terms of the personification of process is in terms of living the tensions involved in those processes and and that being the focus where are the tensions and how are they lived um, not uh, you know what does this particular view of of a process mean for individuals or what does this particular pro me you know view of an of a person I imply about you know the applicability of processes we're not interested in it so much um, the philosophical moves of of uh, what does this view imply about etc um, we're more interested in trying to find uh, the, the, the the way in which tensions that exist inside uh, the personification of processes, um, the way in which those tensions are lived in the real world, and it's th in a sense, it's those things that that are of interest. Now, those tensions, um, why those tensions? Why those kind of uh, those resistances, those counteracting tendencies? Why those? Why are those important? In a sense, because they begin to show us limits of things, um, but partly they're also something that comes from a relationship to schizoanalysis, um, in which often let's take Antiedipus. Often it's 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 um, encountered as uh, um, a, a kind of a philosophical methodology that advocates a kind of incessant productive process going on all the time, and that there's this continual kind of effervescence of life um, effervescence of ideas effervescence of you know living imagery and um, uh, and forms uh, and and actually what's often not encountered like uh, so clearly inside uh, thinking about schizoanalysis is the counteraction tendencies so for productive tendencies there are also anti-production tendencies and it's this particular dynamic of the production tendencies, anti-production tendency, this kind of dynamic that can be explored in the living of the tensions between those things, um, but also then we think enables us to think about the world, to think the world of our contemporary situation of climate crisis um, and racism and colonialism. Um, these processes in which a whole bunch of uh, uh, dynamics that now have radically um, impinging counter dynamics. So the dynamics of capital have radically impinging counter dynamics of climate destruction. The dynamics of colonialism now have radical counteracting impinging dynamics um, of, of a kind of a, 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 um, a disruption of liberalism through racial tension. Let's say that's like something, something along those kind of lines. These kind of um, the, a, a, a disruption of, of the civil, if you like, um, and quite reasonably so. So the interest in, in exploring the lived tensions that encounter uh, 
you know, that can be encountered when we think at different scales. The interest in that is in trying to make concrete this this very peculiar dynamic that's that's very abstract inside schizoanalysis between production and anti-production. Now, what is anti-production? I mean, it's <laughs> it's in one, in some sense that countervailing tendency. But what kind of what kind of process is it? There's an example that was g was given by one of Guattari's collaborators that I quite like, and the example is of a lock and a key. Um, and so, in a sense, the lock we can talk about as something like the production of a controlled connection um, that's dependent on particular materials, rigidity and solidity. You know, there's a kind of uh, you know, um, you can't make a key out of, you know, a soft object very easily. <laughs> they tend to have to be, you know, capable of reproducing themselves and physically interacting and doing certain, there's, there's, there's a certain sort of, you know, relationship, and I'm talking about a physical key here, obviously, there's a certain sort of relationship that the key has that depends upon um, physicality in order to make it work, and yet that very thing that it's that is the condition of its operation, so the condition of the operation of, you know, say the key is, is that it doesn't just change shape. Um, it has a kind of rigidity to it. The condition of its operation is at the same time one of the sources of its collapse. Um, and in this case, through, fi through friction, I mean, through the wearing out of the key. Um, and so we have this kind of, you know, uh, d this kind of production, anti-production dynamic, a dynamic of counteracting. Um, through the process of friction, the, the dynamic of production of a tool uh, such as a key that depended upon a certain sort of rigidity. And so, rather than a kind of bad abstraction, the general idea of this project, the kind of, kind of general line of thought, is to try and produce a better or a good abstraction. And the bad abstraction is something, as I've said, that, that has a kind of nowhere, a no when, no what structure. It has this kind of, like, you know, um, this kind of blank space abstraction in some ways, this view from nowhere. And whereas a, something that's going to have a more positive or is going to be a more concrete abstraction, something that's going to have a better kind of relationship or a better ability to fit, better process, um, in, in, in a sense, a, a good one or a better one is going to emphasize the presence of space and place, not the presence of time and process, and the presence of things like materials and interactions. And so in, I mean, one way of thinking about that is, is a, a good abstraction or a better abstraction is going to be something like a dirty thought. You know, and we want to produce a kind of dirty thought. And I'm aware of all the possible connotations that can occur with that. I mean, that's a kind of like, you know, this is a kind of sexualized idea, you know, a dirty thought. But we want to produce something like a dirty thought, one that's capable of, of thinking the dirt and the friction on the key, the wearing away of material, <coughs> and the wearing away and the counter and anti-production of dynamics. And one that has ambiguity and, and nuance in it, one that has vague edges and, and cross-fertilization. Um, and it's, you know, sometimes a bit of a dangerous word, that, that kind of uh, ambiguity and nuance. Um, and so people want their, their thought to be clean and crisp. And uh, there's, a, there's a, you know, um, a, a lesson early learned in philosophy for myself I in terms of the, 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 the power and the interest of ambiguity. And there's um, a way in which we can, we can I mean, if, if you, one of the readings for, the, um, for this week, one of the preparatory readings, I mean, there was no specific readings for this week and the seminar doesn't have any particular readings. Readings don't really start till next week. Um, but I did give people some some kind of background framing readings in, in the Free University Brighton River. Um, and one of the readings for this week was Chapter 5 of Black Skin, White Masks by Franz Fanon um, on the black experience. And it's a kind of description of uh, black lived experience from a particular kind of um, position, the position of Franz Fanon himself, but also from a particular kind of position philosophically for, uh, where uh, Fanon is inspired and taken up um, in a, a philosophical movement that has a lot of uh, background connections and, and dialogue with existentialism. Um, and so towards the end of chapter five, Fanon talks about um, the way in which, you know, a, a kind of black consciousness that he'd come to through a movement called Negritude, um, which had been inspired by people like Emma Cesar, um, 
that this kind of black consciousness had kind of been dismissed by Sartre as as um, as part of a dialectic. So there was a kind of a, 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 you know a, a moment of racism, the kind of thesis, and then there's a kind of you know counteractive negation of this, the antithesis, and and Sartre is posing. Uh, black consciousness on negritude it's this kind of antithesis and so um, instead of it having as it were value in itself it becomes a reaction it becomes a kind of reactive value um, and uh, Fanon resists this very very strongly um, and he resists it in part through this this idea of, of ambiguity and uh, an idea that in some senses itself comes out of existentialism an idea of resisting the dialectic resisting being captured in the, di in the dialectic resisting being told that the, the the lived experience that you're having or the encounter with the object of your love or all of these things are part of processes instead of being um, the way in which you know, processes are personified, we become just the person, abstract pe persons within a process. And so ambiguity and nuance are kind of dynamics that enable us to push past being captured by um, a process of dialectics and a process of dialectical reason in which you know, everything becomes a moment in, a, in an overarching game. Um, and persons are kind of dropped out of this. Uh, and that's a, a thought that, that is, um, a, a, you know, that kind of reclaiming of the concrete, uh, reclaiming of the experience, reclaiming of, of those kind of um, moments that can't be captured by the dialectic. That, that, that is, is, a, is, a, is a thought that comes almost directly out of um, the origins of existentialism, Kierkegaard's fear and trembling, Kierkegaard's relationship to Hegel, Kierkegaard's resistance. Um, to uh, the way in which rational thought orders and schematizes things and and the way in which you know for Kierkegaard you know the paradox of Abraham for example disrupts these kind of dynamics and it's 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 for us ambiguity in a sense and that production of kind of multiple layers multiple scales and the intersections and tensions of the, of living those you know at the edges of those different scales these enable us to begin to as it, as it, as it were escape the dialectic make our thought concrete without rejecting abstraction and so that in a sense is kind of the dynamic of the research project um, and so if you uh, want to track through with us and follow the line of thought that's what we're going to be doing over the next 10 weeks the next three weeks we're going to be going through Fanon Freud and then a little bit of Deleuze and Guattari so these will be um, offering a little bit of background so if you're just interested in a little bit of the background material feel free to attend those lectures after that we'll be looking a bit more broadly and uh, that will actually the second part of the the seminar space will actually be developed in consultation with and in collaboration with the seminar participants. So I can't completely tell you exactly where that's going to go because it will depend in large measure on the conversation. OK, thank you very much for that tonight. Thank you for your time. Um, I hope that is kind of, you know, uh, gives you a gist of where we're going or we're at. Feel free to ask questions in any form you can. And for those people in FUB, I will see you in a couple of minutes when I open up the Zoom room. Thanks very much, everybody.